in the staffing and operational policies um, for the new campus and our new operations, in addition to uh, a facility management program to maintain the, the new facilities, and an endeavor to manage and coordinate the development of a fee policy and comprehensive fee study. Um, earlier in the fiscal year, um, with a strategic plan goal commitment of becoming debt free, we paid off the Alton debt financing. Um, we've established a traffic and parking commission, implemented a new Ask Lake Forest system as well as a new agenda management system, um, implemented a security camera rebate program for citizens, um, continued to update the Lake, Jor Lake Forest general plan, and finalized the sale of the authority parcel. As we move into 2019, uh, fiscal year 2019-20, some of the things that are on our uh, initiative list are completing the Lake Forest Civic Center, transitioning our operations to the new facilities, implementing program for the new community center, performing arts venue and senior center. Further completion of the five-year strategic plan, um, we have the completion of the general plan and its implementation which will involve a housing element update in addition a zoning ordinance update for the general plan guidelines. Construction of a new five acre park in Portola Hills providing an additional dog park, a sand volleyball court and a pickleball courts. Another strategic plan goal of renovation, ten, renovation of 10 neighborhood parks. The continued progress in the development of the new master plan communities. Overall, the proposed budgets are balanced and consistent with city fiscal policies. So now we can get into some of the numbers. Um, the beginning balance, our proposed beginning balance for the general fund is roughly 11.8 million. The revenues that we have in the proposed budget total 50.8 million with our expenditures at 49.5. Revenues less expenditures are our surplus prior to transfers is 1.3 million. The transfers out to accommodate our reserve policy is 0.3 million, which leaving our ending fund balance in the general fund at the end of the year, 12.9 million. The expenditures total 49.5 million, which is a $2 million increase over the prior year, over the current year, and that represents 4.5%, mainly driven by increase in personnel costs for the new Civic Center and, and Senior Center, as well as uh, contract services for the Sheriff Department. Um, general fund expenditures by department, similar graph that we've shown over the years. Um, the largest department or devotion of our general fund dollars is for police services or public safety, which represents 39% of our general fund budget. The second largest department being public works, which consumes 26% of our operating general fund budget. All of these percentages are within one percentage of all the departments from the prior fiscal year, so there are no material changes in any one department over the current fiscal year. On the general, general fund revenue side, um, property tax is our single largest revenue source. In the proposed budget, we have an increase of 7%, um, which is $1.3 million, and this represents 39% of our general fund operating budget. Sales tax is our second largest revenue source in the general fund, and it totals 15.5 million, representing 30% of our budget. However, it is unchanged from the current fiscal year um, as sales tax has flattened for the city, and we're unable to uh, take an increase based off some of the condition, economic conditions. Um, overall revenues are 50.8 million, which is an increase of 1.9 million, or 3.8% over the prior fiscal year. Our general fund reserves maintain fully funded per policy. The beginning balance is 24 million. And as the revenue is increased 1.3 million, required by the policy to transfer more, more money or additional funds into the reserve of 0.3, would leave our reserves at 24.3 million at the end of the fiscal year, upcoming fiscal year. General fund summary, Gen proposed general fund budget for fiscal year 2019 is balanced. Surplus of roughly 1.3 million before transfers does not include a half of year of one additional deputy reserved for mid-year budget discussion in the upcoming fiscal year.
and that is about two hundred fifty thousand um, dollars that we'll we can discuss not included in the general fund budget as proposed are one-time ceremonial items for our Civic Center opening that includes a grand opening event a ribbon cutting event an open house event and professional service photography the those four items are for your consideration this evening and we'll take guidance on that those total fifty five thousand dollars and those are not included in the operating budget currently the all funds budget starts with the beginning balance of sixty three point three million dollars total revenues for the upcoming fiscal year seventy five point seven our operating and capital expenditures total sixty four point seven million leaving us revenues less expenses of eleven million dollars which will increase our fund balance by eleven million with an ending fund balance of seventy four point three million this includes the general fund all special revenue funds all capital project funds um, of the city um, summary of revenues of all funds this includes all special revenues and capital project funds and the general fund being the largest fund property tax represents 33 percent of our overall budget and sales tax represents 27 percent of our budget these percentages are all consistent with the with the prior fiscal year or the current fiscal year this slide represents how our expenditures are broken down across all funds 60 as a contract city we are leaning most of our costs are in the contractual services which represents 66 percent of our budget and personnel at 20 percent in a contract city this is the normal model in a full service city the representation of personnel would be closer to 90 percent um, that concludes the operating budget for the city I'll move into the housing authority for the upcoming fiscal year start the start the year with roughly 1.3 million dollars in the housing authority um, next year's revenues roughly 13,000 with expenditures of 65,000 um, be spending more than we're collecting next year for um, budgeted amount for contractual services for whatever may need to happen within the housing authority um, leaving us an ending fund balance of 1.2 million <coughs> to wrap up our conversation on the operating budget the budgets are balanced reserves are fully funded our commitment to infrastructure is funded and city is in good fin financial condition for the upcoming fiscal year fiscal year 2019-20 that concludes my presentation and I'm open to questions at this time okay thank you very much um, I want to provide an opportunity for the public to address the council so is there anybody from the public wishing to address the City Council on this item I have one speaker Kenton Boucher Give us one sec to see if we can get one, two, three. There we oh, go. I got cut off early. Thank you. Uh, okay. <laughs> uh, um, good evening, Mayor and Council uh, persons. Uh, my name is Kenton Betcher. Um, I've lived here um, since 1981, almost 40 years. Um, I uh, was born in Fullerton. My mother was born in Fullerton. My grandfather was the blacksmith on the Bass and Cherry Ranch, so I sort of have farming in my, my blood. Um, but in 1986, I purchased a home next to the, the Whispering Hills Park site, which was graded. Uh, it was an IOD uh, through the developer. We were under the county. Um, I paid a, a, a nice premium to be next to the park, and I've always thought we could cut a deal if you'll give me the seven thousand dollars inflated at the s p for 33 years we'll just call it a deal but um, there's 349 other people that would want the same deal um, and long story short we got into squabble with the developer they never developed the park because we weren't at Tramela Roos and uh, sued the developer and they gave us nine million dollars and we paid all our legal fees our reserves were 100 percent we redid our our home um and we we use it as our common area we 
could, we couldn't really build on it, but it was our common area. And uh, when we became a city uh, in 1999, uh, our HOA approached the city and said, you know, we'd like to have you take the park site and build a park. And they said, well, that's the zoning, but we can't guarantee that we would have the money. And I said, well, can you put in there a, a, a clause that says it has to be a park and a, a tight? And they said, no. They said, you're protected by the law that you're giving it in good faith. The, count, uh, the city council is accepting it in good faith. And if you, if they do something not, then you can go back to to court. And I thought, no, that's not the way we want to do it. Anyway, we started in, oops, um, an effort to, to do a garden park um, or a passive park in 2014. And, um, and with different time frame, but long story short, we were in the 2019, uh, 20, uh, 18, 19 to do a $50,000 uh, final design based on three workshops. And then next year, 19, uh, 2019, 2020, um, to construct it. And that was in the June 18, 19, uh, 2018 strategic budget. So in the new budget, it's been pushed out two years, and we would like to see it pushed back. Thank you very much. Appreciate your comments. Larissa Clark also submitted a card. Hi, Larissa Clark. Resident since 1998. Um, <clears throat> I, um, there's a homeless encampment at El Toro Road in Rockfield. Um, I was talking with Lieutenant Taylor today and I'm gonna make an appointment with him. I understand this is a complex issue, but it is growing and they are starting to push down Rockfield and also up El Toro Road because on the corner, um, I believe there's drug deals going on, but my surveillance is not done yet. But I got a lot of good video I plan to share with Lieutenant Taylor. So it's pushing the other homeless up to the bus station, and they're plugging into the city devices. I saw a lady there on a laptop with her phone charging everything under the bus station. This is the beginning of this issue. Can we please be on the forefront of solving it? So with all that said, I know that's complex and I'm going to research it and I'm meeting with other city staff, but is there anything that we can do in our budget to own the own money that we have within Lake Forest to do something? How, and I don't know, and I don't need an answer, but I'm going to research it. How do we get our money back from the county? Because they suck at spending it for us. Is there a way that if we set up our own apartment complex or a charity house or something like that within Lake Forest, as they have done in San Clemente, could we file for grants? Is there funding? Will that then trigger an Obamacare for insurance? What can we do locally as a city? And I would like to see some money, if we can, put towards this. Because the homeowners down by us are very impacted. It is growing. It doesn't change at night. There was so much trash on the sidewalk the other evening, I told my son to get out his camera and video it. So I want to look for solutions. I know the United Way has something, but we have to start here. And that is my number one request for this budget thing. I mean, I emailed everyone on the council, pictures, everything. I heard back from, I don't want to mess up her name. I don't want to disrespect her, but I heard back from Nikki. That is it. She told me it was UCLA. Hmm, that's kicked the can. But I understand we have issues with them too. But please, let's solve this issue here as San Clemente is doing there. I also have a meeting with, uh, I used to work for him, but he owns Dewey's Appliances in San Clemente and his father owns a ton of property. And their store is where the charity homeless place 
went into next. So the Laguna Beach mayor has been in to talk to Alex at Dewey's. The San Clemente mayor, even though he just passed, Mayor Pro Tem has been in to talk to him. And I'm down talking to Alex, and I'm going to tour this center with him on Friday. Because him as a business owner next to a thing that San Clemente is trying to do adjacent, he has concerns too, which goes into the complex issue. I know I'm over my time. Thank you for giving me the extra time. But please, we have a five year. We can do something. Thank you. Thank you very much. That concludes. OK, Facebook Live. No, sir. All right, thank you very much. All right, so it's back to uh, the dais. And this is just to deal with the operating budget, 1920, and the housing. I'm going to take those together. OK, colleagues? Councilmember Robinson. Just a few questions to start off with on the presentation itself. <clears throat> um, let's see here. So you mentioned um, the most of the uh, increase in spending in this budget year um, is due to personnel costs from the senior center, civic center, and performing arts. Yeah, theater, whatever evening. we'll call it. Yeah, <laughs> so. Yes, that is correct. And okay. the increase in the sheriff's contract. Okay, and, and the sheriff's contract, of course. Um, uh, with respect to these uh, internal personal costs, um, I assume we're going to be doing a lot more programming. I mean, we already have a senior center functioning here. Do we expect the, for instance, the participation level to double? Or what, what are some of the thoughts there? I know the facility yeah. is changing, but I'm just kind of curious about why the extra personnel so yes well we're going to be operating for more hours and we have more space so there's more opportunities to program so the rooms the, their, our capacity for example for our Thursday lunches has grown because we have a much larger facility now and so um, we could get into more detail if you'd like from Scott Wasserman but ultimately we have an arts and crafts room we have a wellness room and we have an arts and crafts room and so we have a lot more opportunities to program and so we fully intend to use that facility as much as we can okay and I so I appreciate your comments I'm just curious so do we expect again the the population to increase that are participating or do we feel like they're going to segment out into different rooms because there's going to be more opportunity there for them to participate in other activities um, thank you councilmember Robinson we're expecting a little bit of both. We're expecting the population of seniors that coming uh, coming into the senior center to grow. Um, we're expecting mainly younger seniors. I know the senior advisory board has encouraged staff to do marketing to our younger seniors, which would be 50 and up. Yep. I'm almost a senior. Sure. Um, and we're going to be open about 15 hours more a week. So currently the hours are about nine. Or I'm sorry, 10 to two, Monday through Thursday, and we're looking to move to 10. 10 to 4, uh, Monday through Friday. All right, thanks a lot. I appreciate that. Um, <clears throat> now, you mentioned also in the presentation that uh, no one department has increased more than, say, a percent, uh, you know, up or down, I guess, uh, over the last year. Um, historically, where have we been from a police services uh, perspective since that's kind of the biggest chunk? So we're at 39% this year, I would assume. Last year we were 38 to 40, <laughs> somewhere in that range. So where have we been, say, for instance, over the last five years when it comes to that category? And uh, yeah, it's been consistent. Um, okay. it, it's been, I think, as low as 36 in the last five years, and I think last year was 38. Okay. Um, so this year, it, and there might be some rounding in there, but um, it, the graph came out at 39. Okay. And I, I know that that's a big concern for ourselves as well as all of our neighboring cities. Uh, you know, public safety is one of our most important priorities. Um, one of the reasons why cities exist, um, but we're all very focused on making sure that it doesn't capture a greater and greater share of the overall budget as our budget increases and there's overall inflation, additional personnel costs, um, you know, minimum wage that's going up, prevailing wage issues, things like that. We recognize those costs are going to increase. We're also seeing an increase in revenue as home values are going up and I know sales tax is pretty flat, but our property tax is going up. So that percentage that I'm more focused on rather than the raw number so that's encouraging to hear but um, I want to watch that really closely 
um, years to come. I'm sure you all feel the same way, but I just wanted to make sure that I voiced that. Um, then uh, on the property tax side, um, we talked at great length today. I really appreciate um, your, yours and uh, the city manager's time. Um, <clears throat> I was wondering if you could give maybe a little insight into um, with new home development versus uh, commercial, where we see like uh, the revenue that comes in from say property tax uh, match with the expenditures that that particular uh, new resident or new commercial business might cost us as, as we're looking at other decisions, for instance, the general plan update. Um, do we have any just general idea on like is commercial generally um, more revenue neutral or revenue positive compared to its expense or is residential better or is it difficult to to explain I know it's a very very significant question but just wondering if you might be able to provide a little insight because you know property tax is where all of our revenue growth is sales tax is flat so that's why I'm really focused on that <clears throat> I don't know <clears throat> I'll try to answer that. Sure, if I, I know can. It's a I don't. It, it's a, it's it's a difficult question because it's difficult to analyze what what the difference is. I would say um, if you're asking that it's if it's more expensive, if we're putting more commercial in, or if it's you know cost the city more on the expenditure for commercial businesses to go in or residential to go in. Um, I don't know if I've ever really analyzed it that deep. I would say it's probably about even. It depends on what type of business is going in, and then it also on the other side, it depends on what type of residential you are putting in, whether it's all HOA owned and the streets are owned and the street lights are owned you know by the HOA and the curb and gutter, or you know even on the business side, what's owned it's, it, is it whatever the CC and R's are, whatever if it's got an HOA itself. so it's it's kind of difficult to get that on the fly. We'd probably have to do a little more analysis and then we could bring it back to you. Okay, well, it, I, I think that rather than bring it back as one item, I, I think it's a really good factor to take a look at as we're making land use decisions that, you know, there's a little bit more analysis there. I know that we're constantly trying to do that, and we get some feedback occasionally from police services regarding, like, a permit application for something. They'll tell, like, liquor licenses, as an example. Um, um, you know, they've uh, provided some feedback there on what the – what the potential number of calls might be or, or something like that and how that might impact a particular area. But I think the better we can understand that, the better we'll be able to kind of plan for the future, so to speak, because it, it really seems to me like um, <clears throat> our revenue growth is going to be in the property tax side until uh, the state really tries to figure out how to fairly and equitably distribute sales tax when it comes to online sales. Uh, you know, right now I think as they're trying to, but I don't think they're doing that great of a job, and that's why we're seeing flatness here when you know our consumer spending is probably um, above average, would be my guess, for the state. Um, so we should be seeing growth there, and I just don't think it's being allocated properly. So You are correct. Uh, on the sales tax side, and Kevin could probably answer this, that they are trying to bring more of the Internet sales, but it's all going to go to the pool. We have an estimate of about a buck a, res uh, a buck a resident for us, so it might give us another eighty-five, ninety thousand dollars. But that's it. Whether our community is spending a whole lot more than that or a whole lot less than that, that's about the average we're going to get since it's going into the county pool and the state pools, and it's not coming back. But that's how they're, they're you know, they're just starting this process of tr starting to look at the internet sales and and how to divide that up more fairly between the cities and counties. Yeah, we're in a robust economy, obviously, you know, tremendous growth over the last, say, seven or eight years. And yet you look back at our 1617 uh, sales tax revenue, and we're going to be about 100,000 under that, which and so I'm guessing because the economy is doing well and Lake Forest residents are, are doing well, we see by unemployment numbers and uh, home values and, and things like that, that we're probably spending more than we were in 1617, but we're getting less in tax revenue, sales tax revenue which to me tells me that our allocation from that pool isn't being fairly and equitably distributed. We're getting something, but probably not as much as we should. So again, that's, that's all my focus really on the property tax because the state has to solve that problem. 
and, and we need to advocate for that, but there's only so much control we have over it. So um, <clears throat> would this be a time to get into some of the other questions in the, okay. Uh, let's see. Um, if, if you can just go to someone else, I'll come back. I, I had a lot of questions. Many of them got answered today, but I want to um, uh, try to regroup, so. Okay. Thank you for the presentation. Um, in our expenditures, um, I know we brought on, eventually got a traffic officer in Lake Forest. Was that the half officer that we were talking about, or was that actually a patrol deputy, a sworn deputy? Uh, it would be a patrol deputy, but and we would look at adding it at the mid-year, so it would be six months worth of one. Okay, um, and, and last year we added a dep or a um, traffic officer to help us with parking. Well, two years ago we added a parking person, so it wasn't a deputy. Okay, it's a parking control. So that that, that w that's already that that's they, already in here. I know there was some delay in getting one into the city, um, but we're fully staffed where that we need to be there. Um, the projections are that we're going to need two more deputies in the, in the coming years. Um, is this one is this one half? Are we just bringing them on? Are we not bringing them on at the same time? Or? No. So we decided to stagger, and the reason we're doing that is because we don't know the true cost yet. Um, the county's negotiating a contract right now with some of its unions, so we have a an estimate of what our cost of the sheriff's contract is for next fiscal year. But we know we're going to get a supplemental bill once they decide what they're going to do with salaries. So that's why we wanted to be a little conservative and introduce it at the mid-year. I agree with that approach. There's a lot of variables in the coming years. So, um, in the um, revenues, that I don't see any part of the slide. Uh, is our hotel stays down and we didn't make on here or? Um, the projection for the hotel and the additional hotels um, based on their timeline to construct. I don't have any increase in the proposed budget for the hotels for next year. When we get into the strategic plan, I have those hotels coming on board in years two and three. But, but of the hotels we have right now, are hotels up or down? Um, my analysis right now on the hotel tax is that we're near a ceiling of those revenues, and I'm not comfortable increasing the projection um, for the coming fiscal year. In the prior fiscal year, I only increased at $25,000 of the uh, $3.8 million. So I didn't increase it much last year. I think we're hitting a ceiling there on our TOT, TOT with our capacity and our 10 hotels. So what is the TOT for our city? Um, $3.875 3 for the upcoming fiscal year. Thank you. Anything else? Nothing. No? OK. Yeah, just a quick question. Sure. Um, as far as just a continued comment about the police costs, I, I know that we're staggering uh, staff depending on the budget, but that would be a really good time for us to be really considering privatizing the parking enforcement component of the, the police contract because then we'll be able to get more for our money that way. We'll get policing and then we'll have traffic enforcement. So it's all hope isn't lost, I don't think. Um, and it, and I know that this is a very tenuous conversation, but can you carefully explain to me um, m how we allocate monies for the housing authority, with big picture thinking of homeless or affordable housing? What type of funds can, how can we spend the housing authority monies? This, this is kind of an answer to help Larissa. She came up with a question. Okay, I'll speak in very general terms. And, and the reason we're doing that is that this is a subject of potential litigation. So we need to be, you know, circumspect in how we describe this. But in general terms, you know, our, our city has always looked at this as a house, from a housing first approach that we want to build affordable housing and permanent supportive housing to the extent that we can afford to do that. And so the housing authority is where we have some of those funds. And so through th all of the new construction, we have some affordable housing and lieu fees that we've collected. We have 3.7 million set aside for a project with National Core, who is an affordable housing builder. And so we're working with them right now to find a location in Lake Forest where we can build an affordable housing project, including some permanent supportive housing, which would address 
which um, typically is a place that you can house some people who are now currently homeless in both affordable housing and especially in permanent supportive housing. Um, we also have a project that's currently being built at the Portola Center site. So um, that's a senior affordable housing project. So you'd have to be, make a certain age, but that would also include some permanent supportive housing. But again, you would be a senior in those su permanent supportive housing units. And that's being paid for through the developer. So that's not a city project, but that is being built in town. Um, I guess, does that address part of the affordable housing question? Yes, thank you. Okay, and you know, just a comment on what Larissa said, we'd be happy to meet with Larissa. We always want to educate people who are passionate about the community and want to learn about the topic. And so Chad is open to those meetings and I'm open to those meetings as well. So I look forward to having those conversations with anyone in the community that would like to talk about homelessness. Councilman Robinson. Thanks, appreciate the uh, giving me a chance to re regroup here. Um, just. On, on that last topic, <clears throat> um, former Mayor uh, Gardner and I were on a um, homeless uh, ad hoc committee, and uh, um, even over the last six months, um, I've spent a lot of time talking to the city staff about that issue. So I, I don't want anyone to get the impression that um, because it's not talked about routinely at council meetings that it's not something that we deal with almost on a daily basis here at the city. And uh, you know, I think that the staff is doing the best that they can under a very difficult and uh, circumstances and a very complex issue. Um, there's clearly a lot more that we need to do, but uh, and, and we need to be continuing to monitor it like we are. And I, I understand the frustration that residents might have when they see um, some homeless popping up in, in certain sections of town where they haven't been in the past. Um, <clears throat> just I got a Facebook reminder today of uh, some years past of pictures with my son. We've gone to the Aliso Creek cleanup day uh, many times over the last, say, 10 years. And uh, he's my middle son's usually come along with me. And so today was an anniversary of one of those pictures from three years ago. And, you know, we, we've picked up mattresses and couches and things like that. It used to be that they were kind of hiding more um, in, in the creeks and in the shadows. And, and there probably still are quite a few. But now there are some that are uh, front and center, very visible in parts of town, and um, it's something that I know our homeless liaison officers spending a lot of time on, and, and again, just numerous staff talking about it. I, I would guess that it was probably the number one uh, topic that our city manager worked on last year and uh, most of this year as well. So um, <clears throat> with that said, um, just to jump into some parts of the budget, this hits a few different um, departmental budgets, but I wanted to talk a little bit about some of the associations that we belong to, um, that we're members of, and I'm not exactly sure that we're getting our best bang for the buck in being a part of those associations. Um, I'm not suggesting today that we cut the funding, but I would like to direct staff to look at uh, trying to find a way that we get more of a tangible benefit out of whatever our contribution is to those. So just to, to name off a few, um, <clears throat> the, the first one would be, um, I think it's in the economic development budget, uh, the Orange County Business Council. I think that it's a, a very important organization for Orange County, but for our $5,000 a year membership, um, I don't think that we're really participating in much. And what I would like to see, um, just one idea, and I'm open to what my colleagues might think, but would be maybe to continue to uh, support the organization with that that same dollar amount but ask for like for instance in maybe a study they're doing on homelessness or affordable housing or something like that that they do a little deeper dive into Lake Forest to give us some actual data that we could work from rather than just having some general county data and uh, so that, that would be the idea with Orange County Business Council um, I'm really not sure about um, uh, ACCOC as an example, I understand that a lot of the um, city staff um, don't really participate in any of the training um, that's offered. They do participate in the League of Cities training um, that's available. But again, I'm not looking to necessarily cut the funding, just try to find a way in which we could talk to that organization and get something of more benefit to the city rather than just paying membership dues. And in, in this particular case, I think mainly what we get is some council members that participate in some networking events and different seminars that are available and then uh, occasionally 
we get some uh, a legislative recommendation from that organization, so they're reviewing some legislation. But um, so that that would be kind of my my thought regarding those. Um, so again, I think they're Orange County Business Council, League of California Cities, ACCOC, and uh, those are kind of the three that I've identified. So that, that's my thought. <clears throat> I've got more, but I'll just kind of stick to one issue at a time. Okay. Did you also discuss that particular? Um, so I'm going to um, daylight something here, and that is um, when I look at the graph where we see going from a positive position to a negative position when we get out a few years into our, our budget situation, that concerns me. Um, and so I think there is value in us getting an ad hoc committee formed to really spend more time looking at the operating budget to some degree, but obviously we'll approve that tonight but really looking uh, deeply at the second year of the capital budget and then and the strategic uh, plan as well, since we find a number of those types of initiatives and memberships and all that kind of stuff, I think we can look at that. So uh, I'll be working with the city manager to form an ad hoc to spend more time doing a little deeper dive on some of these types of initiatives, looking at the membership issues, a myriad of things, to largely because of my concern about how we have a, a difficult circumstance up ahead if we don't make some corrections. So uh, I'm just letting you know that that's where I'll be going by the end of the evening. That That's something I think would be helpful for all of us to spend more time understanding. And I've talked to the city manager about this, that um, <laughs> we're good at adding programs and whatnot, but I'm not sure we'd spend much time thinking about what we maybe don't need anymore. And so it would be an opportunity to take a good look at that as well. Maybe there's some programs that we should rethink or recalibrate, retool, refund, I don't know. But it's sort of all on the table to take a, a good hard look at it. So I think that'd be um, a worthy endeavor. So as it relates to the strategic plan, um, I think that's something we should look at um, more closely. And I think it can, it can bring in those ideas about memberships and seeking the value proposition for those. I. I'd be very supportive of that. I know that you know you need an operating budget in place by July first. You need us to approve it by June eighteenth. So, uh, but you know, I would be uh, more than happy, even with a busy schedule, to participate in an ad hoc committee like that if if one is formed. So, <clears throat> I don't know if there were any other comments, or I can hop to my next oh. issue. So, proceed. Okay. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about grants. I know that we've talked about this in years past, and we've had. A few different uh, iterations of, of uh, finding grants, um, trying to do things internally and then externally with a few different organizations and then drilling down to one. Have we had any success in gaining grants? I know that the recent fire grant that we were going to work with HOAs on, uh, you know, we didn't end up getting. So, yeah, aside from the OCTA grants that um, Tom Shops participates with, we haven't received any grants through the grant writing service that we've contracted with. Okay. I, with that said, I mean, you know, I, I'd like to strike that from the budget in any and all places. I, I don't want to spend money on grants. If we, that, that's why my initial idea, which no one was willing to go with, was that they'd get a percentage of the grants that they gave to us, and obviously no one wanted to go with it. They'd rather have, you know, cash in hand, and then, you know, their results are what they are, and, you know, it's unfortunately disappointing. I'm sure that there's some really good companies out there, but so far we haven't really had much success, so. I'm sorry to interrupt. Do you want to make that a motion right now to? Uh, to... Yeah, I'll, I'll uh, make that part of an overall motion. I'd be happy to include that, so, um, yeah. I, to get lost. And unless, I, how would you all prefer that we did that? You want to see them one at a time, or you want to put yeah, it all? Okay. Well, I, I would just move then that we cut, uh, you know, grant find uh, grant finding consultation. Yeah. I was yeah. In fact, I I thought we were, this is just recommendation, so this is to put it on the uh, for the future agenda. Yeah. So when we present the budget to you, we wouldn't have the grant <laughs> writing or consulting okay, in the budget. You. All right. Thank you. So we can go ahead and vote on that matter. Motion passes four to zero with Mayor Pro Tem absent. Uh, then I, I got a chance to uh, talk to Mr. Wheeler, our Director of Public Works, um, before the meeting. I got a lot of my answers, uh, my questions answered. Um, uh, there was one that uh, that I didn't yet. So um, in the goals for the Public Works Department, and I failed to ask this question of you, so it's it's my fault. But um, 
there, there's a uh, the TSSP, which I'm, I believe stands for the Traffic Signal Synchron Synchronization Pro Plan Project, whatever the P stands for. Um, and it shows over the last few years that our goal is 70% and it kind of stays at 70%, which I think is incongruent with our trying to get more signals synchronized. I know that we actually even have some capital projects in here uh, that have some Measure M2 funds. So uh, could you just elaborate a little bit on what the goals are for the department, what you're really trying to accomplish when it comes to traffic, uh, traffic light synchronization? Thank you. Yeah, it, what this really reflects is topping out on coordinating all of our arterials. And so um, what the 30% the is that, that's not coordinated right now are your, is along ridge route and uh, some of the other isolated signals that we have throughout the city, um, Saddleback Ranch Road, at Fawn Ridge, things that, that aren't quite. We're, we're adding, um, we're coordinating, or we're connecting to our, our system, everything on El Toro going up to, um, to Portola or to Fawn Ridge will be our, our, our last one up there. Um, so this is really kind of where, where, where we're topping out. We, we don't coordinate the independent signals. They're, they're on their own. And so this is really actually a reflection of it being in a good place in, in regards to coordination of signals. Okay. I, I know that we still have ongoing projects. So is that updating signals that have already been synchronized, but it, there's some new technology uh, to improve those, the, what makes the signal synchronized? C correct. And, and traffic um, patterns change also. So every three years... We're, we become eligible again to apply for grants from, from OCT on this. So we're redoing Lake Forest Drive. We just got the grant for that. Uh, we're doing El Toro Roads under construction right now. Uh, we're laying some fiber optic cables on El Toro Road. So we're always going through the system and, and retweaking the system. We've got one act of construction on Los Alisos with the other two neighboring cities that we have. Okay. Was it last year that we didn't get some OCTA funding? I seem to recall. Correct. We didn't get Rockfield. Did. Okay. Uh, so we switched out. That just didn't compete very well Okay. Um, because of the volumes and, and things. Um, so we got Lake Forest instead. We're looking at a way to, to kind of back into Rockfield since all of its major corridors are already synchronized. Lake Forest and Bacon stuff. We're trying to do our own coordination system. Um, anyways, we're, we're, we're working on that. Okay. All right. Um, thank you. I appreciate the uh, response there. Um, kind of still sticking with public works. Um, <clears throat> while we're in the goals, it talks about um, the waste diversion. And we've had quite a few conversations I've, with you and I have. I've talked with CRNR on a number of occasions. I'm really concerned about plastic and how that might impact us both from not meeting uh, statewide requirements as, and I know we do right now but my, my concern is just um, a lot of that plastic gets exported we know that the China market's been shrinking pretty significantly and uh, I don't know if you're familiar with there was the uh, basil co convention no uh, no relation to our our fine councilwoman here but the basil convention um, last week where 187 uh, countries signed on to a treaty saying they wouldn't ship certain types of plastic didn't include recycled bottles and things like that. I, I think those were exempt from this, but I'm really concerned about the further impact that had. And of the 187, the United States was not one of them. One of the 10 or so cities or uh, countries that weren't uh, um, participating in that, but those 187 are countries that we can't export to. So in effect, it's going to limit our ability to do that. And so I'm really concerned about that. I think that we should kind of stick to it just to make sure that we're meeting all of our diversion requirements. Every city will have the same challenge we will because this is an international problem that needs to be dealt with. But, um, you know, I'm kind of curious as to what CRNR and all the rest of the, the companies out there that provide this service are going to do to address this. Are they going to start cleaning this plastic, pelletizing it themselves, something like that, or what's going to happen. So just want to make sure I express that. Now, um, let's see. <clears throat> the, uh, there's there's a, a few things that you know, again, they, they get to this, should we still be doing this? So maybe this is just all part of that ad hoc committee. Um, but uh, um, 
I'll probably get <laughs> a tomato thrown at me sometime in the next week for saying this. Um, I'm not really sure, like I, I see the value of continuing to have a community calendar. Um, you know, I know uh, Councilman Voigt loves passing them out at the beginning of the year. You know, people always have a smile when he receives them. I, I think a lot of them end up in drawers and things like that. And so, you know, there, there's a bunch of that little kind of stuff in here that, um, you know, I, I think that we have to be really cognizant of, uh, you know, where um, our expenditures are. Um, that was another thing. I think some of the rest of this that I have is going to touch um, the uh, the capital budget. It, some of it kind of goes back and forth, but um, I think I'll leave it all there for now. Um, the The last thing that I guess there's one more question that I have, and I don't know how well you're going to be able to answer it right now, but the budget doesn't um, really tell me what revenue is generated with specific projects that I see line items for expenditures. I know we've talked about this a little bit, Keith and I have talked about this, but um, there's a few examples in the budget itself. Um, for instance, we're talking about the harvest fair and whether we're going to add a day and it gets pretty specific. So I can't remember the dollar amount down exactly, but I want to say that we generate about $8,000 in revenue, something like that. I think it was about $5,400 in 54, revenue. Is that before the split or is that with That's the after the split. After the split. Okay, so I was wrong. So it's about 11000 then we split half of that with the with the county. We get 5400 but we're spending 20000 right? So that kind of gives me a, okay, I'm recouping about $0.25 cents on the dollar here. And uh, um, so I'm just, I'm really curious about knowing that from a, uh, program by program and maybe this this fine little packet that you just gave me here for the fee study um, that I just got tonight maybe this will tell me down to the specifics but you know I I really feel like we need to be looking at at you know cost recovery um, as much as possible for those um, those events those things that we're doing um, that are uh, um, benefiting the residents again I don't want to see anything cut. I would love to try to see those programs continue. I'd love to try to see more, but just think about it in a more creative way. So like as an example, we've got uh, four movies in the park this summer. I, I believe that's the number if, I, if I'm not mistaken. Heck, I'd love for there to be a movie in the park every week, right? You know, why not? You know, but how can we get to a cost recovery there? So could there be vendors that are selling things during those events and they're funding the movie, right? But they're the ones that are really putting it all, they're, they're, they're the funding source, right? And if they have the, uh, if they've got a, a model that works for them where they can generate that kind of income to make that happen, we could have movies in the park every single weekend, right? I would love that to happen. So it's, I'm trying to think outside the box a little bit more Again, I don't want to see the programs cut in any way. I'd love to see them expanded, but you know, can this actually work with, uh, is there a hybrid model or could it be just you know, purely something that could be funded and, uh, you know, outside of the budget, but still it could exist for residents. So it's kind of, I think you see where I've been going the last few months and you know, it's, it's been on my mind for quite some time. I'm just kind of verbalizing it a little bit more now than I have in the past. Um, There's a whole lot in that, so I'm not I'm not really sure exactly how to how to go about this because um, I, do you think an ad hoc committee is the right way to go? I do because this is going to take a you know uh, some staff work, but some more discussions than you can really have at the dais during a public meeting. You know, it's it's going to require some research and some brainstorming, and I think it's just going to be more. We need more time to come up really dive into something like that. Okay. Well, I, with that said, if, if we end up with an ad hoc committee, as, as busy as I am, I would really like to be on the committee. Yeah, so. I, I would really like to be on that committee too. And the fact that, um, you know, uh, there, <laughs> yeah, but um, I, I think that, you know, we'll have to draw straws for that because the fact that um, as much as you want to um, cost recovery, there are cities like Yorba Linda that's doing six concerts in the park this summer. To, um, the city of Orange does them every Wednesday night throughout the summer. So 
Um, you know, we, we, we actually do provide something that I don't think there's a way, that would be a real creative way to try to bring cost recovery back. We have a sports park that we could have moves that maybe a, a better way to have venues out there where we can have people that actually are selling merchandise or that people that would maybe be willing to help us. But that'd be really creative to do that. But I, I don't see how um, we're already um, – um, the sports park is an 86 acre jewel. I've always called our sports park a jewel for South Orange County. But the fact is that Irvine markets their sports park to club soccer teams to come in and actually have tournaments. We don't do that. We don't have any club soccer tournaments in our city. And just to say that AYSO is a community based AYSO soccer entry level soccer program, which is a great addition in a community. Um, involvement but the fact is that the kids that are coming to play for a tournament that we are getting five dollars ahead for the kids that are playing um i think doesn't compare to what the competitive level that the state of the arts irvine one is having and i've, I've offered that we joint venture with them because they have overflow on every time they have a soccer field, uh, soccer tournament they have their soccer tournaments are actually have bring in such big tournaments in that they don't have capacity at their sports park so they're going to other sports parks and so i think our sports park would be a great addition to add to that venue but um we've got to be able to work with them and i think that our staff uh, has been unable to do that and i think that that'd be a great revenue source because we have an 86 acre sports park that isn't being marketed um, so I, I think you, you're talking about revenue increase um, or, or cost recovery, but uh, it, that's something that bothers me because I've brought it up time and time again. I've talked with staff in Irvine. I've talked to the Irvine Chamber. They've actually got a, a full-time marketing guy in the Irvine Chamber that actually goes out and books tournaments at the sports parks in Irvine. Um, it, so it's something that they are doing a lot of the legwork on that, but the fact that we can tie into it because we got a state-of-the-art sports park ourselves I, I i would beg to differ a little bit so i i understand the soccer tournament part but you know I, I think that look you can always market better but i think that we do a decent job um well some, i'm some, actually in the field and so i'm actually I play my daughter is actually a competitive soccer player and volleyball player and we could actually market that better because the fact that they're always looking for field space okay and, and where i'm going with this is so like on friday nights we had two flag football leagues that, that were using the facilities there. I assume they were paying fees, two different ones. They were maxing that place out. It, 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 you know, you everybody tells me about midweek where, you know, there's softball teams that are all paying fees. Now, are they paying enough? I don't know. That, that's, that's a completely different story. But, you know, now are the Residency gets first priority. And so the fact is those fees are so low that there is cost. You're the one talking about cost revenue increase. And so I'm just saying that we're, that would be a good place to start because of the amount of money we spend and upkeep of that park. Correct. Yeah, I just don't want to. Uh, uh, you want to get rid of the five dollar, the three dollar calendars? I see. <laughs> well, this That's this may it. be a wonderful <laughs> subject for our ad hoc to discuss, Mr. Mayor. Since there's so much interest in being on the ad hoc, yes, just a, a, a brief, a brief bit of information. So we have, we offer about eleven tournaments per year. We have scheduled them around the soccer seasons, the baseball seasons. We've done that at the request of you know the sports organizations. <laughs> Um, it is a policy that council approved. You can certainly revisit the policy, and I would also recommend that when the fee study comes up, um, you can take a look at the tournament policies and also the field field usage fees. You'll have an opportunity to review all of that. Okay. Councilman Robinson, do you have anything else? I, I think it'll be a great discussion for the ad hoc committee, <laughs> and if I'm and if I'm not on it, I'll give you pages and pages of notes of my thoughts if that doesn't violate the Brown Act, so. Okay. <coughs> Councilmember Basil, did you have any? Um, well, regarding the ad hoc, I'm glad you said that because I have, I've been writing down ideas for the ad hoc committee, so if, if, if they're willing to accept notes from other council members, then I think it's a great idea. Good, and, and I think at the right time, we would love to have all the ideas and we can make a nice, big, robust agenda for items to to who knows maybe a couple ad hocs if depending on how 
deep we go into various issues. So did you have anything else for? No, I, I just like to see the um, actually, since we're talking about the line items, the, the cost revenue recovery at the sports park and our for our tournament play and what we think we're gaining back on that. Thank you. OK, so um, going through this process and then holding up the strategic plan next to the operating budget, we see some crossover in year one of the strategic plan because it, it, it has the potential to influence the 1920 budget. And I know we'll have more conversation on the strategic plan, but um, since there is some overlap between year one of the strategic plan and the 1920 operating budget, I, I want to see if we can just briefly go through some of those, a couple of tables that were in our staff report for the strategic plan um, again, my intention tonight would be that we table the strategic plan in general, but there is an overlap in this one, in this first year of the strategic plan. So there's some items which staff and the staff report indicates are already included in there. Uh, the zoning uh, ordinance update, general plan, uh, the sheriff's department, we heard about some staffing and some of the other <laughs> staffing items mentioned. So those are already in there, a feed recovery policy, financial management system. So I'm in the strategic plan um, portion, and for those who want to get it electronically, I'm on page 366 if you. So assuming there's no changes, unless staff has anything else or my colleagues have anything else you want to talk about, those items were called out by staff in the strategic plan in year one, which is the 1920 budget. Is there anything else we want to talk about? And again, I'm focused just on year one. Uh, Mayor, members of the council, just to remind you about the Civic Center opening events, those four things that were in your staff report. Yeah, we'll get to that too. I got that here. So yes, thank you. Thank you for the reminder. So unless my colleagues have any other thoughts around items that are included in year one of the strategic plan. Is that, is that including, so that's the added second day for the Autumn Harvest Festival? Uh, no, that's on the next section of items that for consideration that are not in the 1920 budget. But on, on page 366, it, it, you called out that Autumn Heart is the third call, uh, the third line down. Yeah. I think, you're, Mayor, you're talking about the table that's on 363, table one. Those items are included in the budget, and I think you wanted to go through those to confirm <laughs> that the council wanted those in year one. So that's in the budget. Okay, well. Okay, yeah, my 365, I guess. Somebody else is 363. Um, so the, I'm under the heading of revenue and expenditure projections. Yes? Okay. Yes, table that's, one. Yes. yes. Okay, that's my 365. Anyway, okay. so yeah, the zoning ordinance, the other item that you're referring to that I'm seeing is on under the general fund, table three, potential the, new general okay. fund expenditure. Page 366, gotcha. My 368, gotcha. Okay, so at least. So back on the 363, I guess it is, table one, call it table one. Um, make sure my colleagues have nothing else, though those are in the budget. We want to make sure they stay in the budget. Staff, Portola Park Maintenance, Senior Resident Volunteer Program, Fee Recovery Policy and Study, New Senior Center Staffing, et cetera. So we're all good with that. And again, that's because they cross over with 1920. So then if we can go to table three, potential new general fund expenditures. Again, I'd like to focus just on plan year one, because that's the one that influences this budget, this fiscal year budget that we're discussing. And you can see that there's some of these items are listed as just a one year item, but several are ongoing costs. The Autumn Harvest Festival mentioned, et cetera. So, these are not included, as I understand it, these are not included in the operating budget. And I will just say that that does not suggest that they will never be funded. That can be part of the ad hoc's discussion to see if there's some that we do, we do want to bring forward later. So colleagues, Council Member Basil. Um, I'm not sure how everyone else feels, but I think um, getting wiping community choice aggregation feasibility study off of this year. I, I'm not really interested in pursuing it, but if the council would like to maybe push that out a year or two years, I'm okay with that. But I'm, I'm not interested in doing this study, so I would support removing it from the budget completely. And that, so it's not, just to be clear, I mean, it, it's not in the budget. 
Right. As, okay. Removing it's, it from what could be the budget. Oh, yeah. It's not it, the community choice aggregation is not currently in the budget, and that be a, it would take an action for us to put it in there, is what I'm understanding. That is correct. Yeah. Okay. So it's not remove. It is. Let which ones do you want to add? The, yeah. This is under the heading of potential new general fund okay. expenditures. It's not in there now. I just want to make sure that we're. So so we're going to vote this all at one time. Um, the only ones that I, I really think that. The, the astronomy that, that was a good turnout at the sports park and a Star Wars night but then Councilman Robinson wants to find a way to find fee recovery on those and so um, it, it, that that's something that I think that is good for the community to have during the summer times um, the okay. Civic Center holiday lighting is something that's not in the budget right now but it's that's one correct. of the possible add-ons well, we, we need we either need to make give direction or they can sit here and if we don't do anything that can be part of the ad hoc and look at it. Otherwise, it takes an oh. action to put them on. It, why, why, why don't we just leave this all for the ad hoc to talk over and we'll bring it back. Works for me. Okay. So unless not hearing any objections to that. So we'll, those items will be part of the ad hoc uh, discussion, assuming we have one. <laughs> So then that still leaves the Civic Center opening discussion. Uh, I think I heard $55,000 for a few different line items for that. And that's, you're looking for council direction on that. Yes. So if it would be helpful, we could uh, give you a brief description of each of those line items. If That'd be helpful. Like. Okay. So why don't we start with the first one? Uh, so Scott, if you could handle the first line item. Sure. Thank you, Deborah. Um, the community service staff is proposing basically an opening event for the new Civic Center. And it's essentially an event that's designed to invite, it's a one-time event designed to invite the public to enjoy the space. Learn about the space, learn about the, the, uh, the, the facilities, the, the new services that will be offered, particularly the community center, um, for which we're hoping to draw a lot of revenue. We really want people to see um, what can be done there. And the idea behind the event, um, I can give just sort of a thumbnail sketch, would be in all of those spaces, right? So the community center, performing arts center, senior center, the courtyard, thank you. The courtyard, um, we would have some kind of event going so that people would see the potential for the space. It's a, it's a marketing it is. tool it's, as well. It's a marketing tool, correct. Sure. And it's to, to kind of showcase the, the campus to the residents. Okay. All right, colleagues. I like the idea. I think the cost is pretty high. Um, if there's a way that we can either streamline a little bit, save a little bit of money, or maybe market it to particular businesses in the city that would like to also be highlighted during the grand opening, we could ask if there'd be, you know, sponsorship to get your logo as part of things, maybe, a, you know, thousand dollars here from you know some of our big businesses that it would it would help local businesses but it would also help us too so I would support either streamlining it cutting it down or maybe petitioning some local s businesses to see if they'd be willing to sponsor um, so from a budgetary perspective I'm not sure how to tackle that maybe you could help us on that one uh, I think what we would do is um, come back with a new budget for this and give you a little description on what a streamlined event might be. Okay. And then uh, we could talk with our economic development staff and figure out, okay, what would be the sponsorship opportunities and what could we expect to generate if we went out and looked for sponsors. Okay. And we anticipate um, bringing back the operating budget to you for another review, the first meeting in June. So that's when we would have that information. Good. Is that clear enough then? Is it, did you have anything else on that item? No, just uh, well, I'm, yeah. I guess I guess I have a little bit more to add to that. Um, so, what would we expect attendance-wise? I mean, I know like when we did the sports park opening, we probably had three to five hundred people. I don't know exactly how many it was, but I'm just guessing. So. Yeah, I think you know throughout the day we we had quite a few people go through. I don't think we'd have as many people at the Civic Center because it's not. Um, you have to know where it is to get there, so we're going to advertise quite a bit. So I'm thinking it would be less. I don't know if, Scott, you have an estimate. I wasn't there for the yeah, sure. opening of the sports park, so I would. you're probably right. So probably t 200, somewhere in there. Okay. Um, well, I, 
it's a one-time expense, which, you know, this isn't something we do, you know, every day. I think there's some, definitely some value in celebrating a $70 million <laughs> facility. And, uh, you know, it, it is a little chunk of money for sure. No question about that. And we're trying to be incredibly frugal, um, you know, moving forward, making sure we're providing high level of service at the most, you know, cost effective way we possibly can. Um, but, you know, because it's a one time and, you know, this is really a community celebration, you know, I would wish that more people from the community could attend, but we're just going to be realistic about how many people will show up. Um, you know, I'm not overly concerned about the budget, but if there are, you know, some areas to cut a little bit, you know, I mean, it, it's it, unfair for me to, you know, try to cut in a bunch of different areas and then not say, you know, we're going to look at everything. So, you know, but I'm not, I, I don't think that we need to be completely austere here, you know. So we, we still should, again, celebrate the fact that, hey, it's, you know, great facility, um, a lot of, a lot of communities in Orange County who've built uh, city halls have seen crazy cost overruns in the millions, if not tens of millions of dollars. Um, I don't know where we're going to end up, but I'd say that somewhere around on budget. So, you know, I would say a, a little bit of money to celebrate this event is, is not, you know, a bad thing at all. I'm, I'm definitely supportive of it. I would agree with um, Councilwoman Basil that um, I think the excess of, of four thousand dollars for a photographer and the amount of money that we're putting into that, um, the output of people <laughs> coming. I think the Civic Center um, isn't going to be a much bigger draw than the sports park was. And, you know, the sports which was an eighty-six acre sports park with walking trails, volleyball, soccer, basketball. Um, so I. I uh, I'd, I'd rather take that back to the ad hoc and let the ad hoc talk about it. I, I don't think timing wise, I don't know, may, it may not work for the ad hoc. I don't think they'll be far enough down the road on that one. But I think there's some general direction here to maybe sort of <laughs> right. lean this out a little bit and maybe give a little more detail so we get an idea of what, what our money's <laughs> getting us. And right. We'll come back first yeah. meeting in June and give you a little more detail. And, yeah. you know, there's, there's photographers that work with the chamber now. Mm. Um, well, let's talk about the photography line item. Brett, do you want to cover that and the ribbon cutting? Yes, good evening, Mayor and City Council. Um, so the plan is also, in addition to the grand opening, we were going to have a ribbon cutting uh, the first day that the building is actually open, in which we would be inviting dignitaries to attend. Uh, the line item that you see in front of you is essentially for uh, rentals, if we needed overhang chairs, um, flowers, potentially balloon arch, that type of thing. Um, and then the photographer was really someone that could be there to photograph that event, photograph the opening house, um, and also uh, for drone footage of the Civic Center that we would use for multiple uh, PR campaigns on the entire campus. Thank you. Well, I think the staff has direction then to come back, maybe lean it out a little bit, and give us a little more detailed information so we can take a closer look at it. Okay, um, is there anything else the staff's looking for other than a motion, obviously? Do you want us to, or, or is this a workshop and you have enough direction, you don't need anything else more from us? Yeah, I, I think we're good on the operating budget. If you'd like to okay. segue into the two-year CIP, we could do Housing? a presentation there. Do you want to do that? Or the or are you good on that, too? I think we're good on housing. Okay. I don't think Does any, any my colleagues have anything on the housing budget? Don't have anything on housing. Are, are we going to come back to, because I have a couple of other things on these other tables. Which tables Pages 363 to 370. Um, just had a, a, a quick comment before we segue. Okay. Um, on table five, it talks about the gas tax user account fund expenditures. Um, there's an item on there for Cook's Corner traffic signal and design. Um, as, a, as a person who lives in that community, I can tell you, that Cook's Corner traffic light is going to be a big problem for the Portola Hills community because adding a, an additional street light, you know, in a, in a small amount of space on a highway that was normally 55 miles an hour, 45 to 55, those commuters are going to start looking for alternate ways to get around this extra light because that's one light here, light at Ridgeline, you got Glen Ranch, you got Painted Trails. I mean, it, it's, 
There's a lot of them. So what I'd like to do is, is if we can add a component to this to maybe put a traffic study to check what the impact is going to be on the Portola Hills community with pass-through traffic. Because I can guarantee you pass-through traffic is going to increase on our residential streets if that light is added. Can we do that? <laughs> yeah, yes, we well, can do that. We can add that us. to the study. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever Council's desire is, we'll, we'll be uh, glad I, to look I, into I that. I actually have a question on that. Um, why even do you say, what's, what's causing us to want to put the stop sign or a light in there? Um, yeah, every, every two years, the city goes through and checks all the traffic signals, or all the intersections uh, for the, the need to add additional traffic signals. Um, so this traffic signal in this intersection, uh, excuse me, has met warrants. So warrants are just a, a set of criteria that the state looks at generally when you need a traffic signal. At this particular one, it's not an accident warrant. There's several different warrants you can meet. But because of the increase in traffic on Santiago Canyon Road, the traffic's backing up on Live Oak, and it can't make the left turns. There's not enough brakes in traffic for them to turn onto the road. That's just going to get worse. When that starts happening, now you can have safety issues when people get frustrated and start moving forward. So it's warranted. It's something that we need to track and, and should move towards. Um, we've got it pushed out in year three and four, so really we have two more years before we need to really talk about it that we feel comfortable with. We took this item to the Traffic and Planning Commission, or um, yeah, Traffic and Parking Commission, excuse me. Um, they they felt comfortable moving it out for a two-year cycle and then looking at it again in, in two years when we come back to address it. We can certainly include any kind of cut through traffic or study through Fawn Ridge, um, Saddleback Ranch, or Ridgeline and, and Saddleback Ranch Road and things like that. With that, if it's the council's desire, we're really not scoping it out with, with this plan, but it's more of a placeholder for our five-year. Right. Yeah, I just don't want it to get forgotten in <laughs> two years when we look at this again. I want to make sure that those that community is protected from additional unnecessary traffic through, so. Mm -hmm. Very good. I, Councilman? I, I, I agree with Councilman Basil because the fact that I think the pass through traffic would be immense going up um, through Portola Hills coming from that. And the fact is that I, I don't really see any new growth up Live Oak Canyon. So where, where is potential growth coming from? Are you think they're cutting through from Santa Margarita? No, what's happened, I can tell you, what's happening is people are using Santiago Canyon to commute into Lake Forest. But they're talking about the live oak, the T there, or Cook's Corner. Right, well, the, the issue is, is once you, if you're coming from Live Oak, you're not going to be able to pull out in, right. into traffic because there's going to be so much increased traffic on Santiago Canyon because of all the commuters using Santiago to avoid the, the toll road or whatever the case may be. So um, it, it, this is a fifty thousand dollars study and then a three hundred thousand proposed light that we're putting up. Correct. That's on the that's on the master plan to do that. If council uh, wanted to direct us, we could update the project sheet to include that information so we don't lose it in, in two years. Uh, we could do it that way if if we get a consensus from council to do that. Do I need to make that as a motion? No. Okay. 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 Now I'm seeing one of our commissioners. Who wants to weigh in on this? Uh, well, not that subject, but uh, oh. I, I, well, I just want to make sure because we're we're talking sort of operating budget, two year. Right. Okay. Well, I was talking about wanted to talk about table three, the potential new general fund expenditures. I'm not sure if you were still talking about that or got off that. Uh, we I think we were off of that. Um, Could I just wanted to ask a question, a clarification? So are all those traffic studies that we had in there not approved, or are they approved to go in the budget? I, I That's my question. I think okay. the ad hoc is going to be looking at those. Yeah, we're going to have an ad hoc committee. The ad hoc is going to look at those too? Yes. Oh, okay. Yep. Thank you. Thank but, you very much. But I, th I think if you have some comments to share, because uh, ad hoc won't be a meeting like this, yeah, so those this would were be the right time. Unanimously approved by the Traffic Commission as extremely high priorities to reduce traffic congestion. To me, they're, they're reasonable priced studies to do to fix a whole lot of traffic issues. And doesn't mean we're going to actually do the work. It's are those intersect those improvements feasible can we do them and what benefit will they have and frankly a lot of the other things you're doing tonight are really good traffic improvements but these in the traffic commission's opinion have the most bang for the buck for things we haven't considered yet and we're urgently urgently hoping you approve them 
those seven or eight studies, please. Thank you Thank very you. much. Appreciate it. Don't forget to fill out a speaker card. I did. Ah, oh, good. I did. <laughs> yeah. Ah, very good. Uh, okay, so where are we now? What are you? What do you have to? You had that was table five. Is there anything else? And again, uh, this is under the strategic plan. I mostly want to focus on year one, if it's okay, and that we will get to the two, three, four, and five will be part of the ad hoc's discussion. So uh, I'll move to t table um, five, plant year one as is. So, Mayor and members of the council, um, what I'd like to suggest is that we have our presentation on the capital improvement projects. Okay. And so that covers the projects that are currently slated for year one and some in year two, and then do a review of that, and then we'll go from there on anything that's left that are on these tables. Thank you. So with that, I'd like to turn it over <laughs> to our Director of Public Works, Tom Wheeler. Thank you, Mayor and Council Members. Uh, Doug Erdman, the Assistant City Engineer, will be giving our uh, an overview of our capital projects, just a, a brief overview of um, what we've done and, and really moving forward what we're proposing in this, in this budget. And there's, of course, detailed budget sheets for each individual project in your packet. Thank you, Mayor and Council Members. I'd like to present a brief overview of the Capital Improvement Projects budget for 2019-2021. Uh, first, I'd like to bring your attention to some of the projects that were uh, completed in the past budget cycle, most notably the Civic Center rough grading, parking structure, and campus design, Veterans Park, and years five and six of the city's seven-year uh, slurry seal program. We have several ongoing projects, including the Portola Center Park, street resurfacing of Dimension Drive, Civic Center Drive, and Portola Parkway at the 241, the neighborhood park renovation of Peachwood Park, and most notably, the Civic Center project. For the 2019-2021 capital improvement budget, there are a total of 38 proposed projects, 12 traffic, three street, two environmental, and 21 parks and recreation projects. Of the 12 traffic projects, uh, include uh, one of them includes a pilot project allowing protective permissive left turns at signalized intersections. This project would install this type of signalized phasing at Town Center and Marketplace and Foothill Ranch and Rockfield Boulevard and Center Drive at Gateway Plaza near the I-5 and Lake Forest Drive. There is also an OCTA-led traffic signal synchronization program for Los Alisos and several Foothill Circulation Phasing Plan and Lake Forest Transportation Mitigation Plan projects, including the ultimate improvements at Bake Parkway and Tribuco, uh, Irvine. Uh, with the previous CIP, Council authorized the project adding the dedicated eastbound right turn lane at Bake Parkway to southbound Tribuco Road. The ultimate improvements would add, would convert northbound right turn lanes on Tribuco and Irvine and also add restripe the third southbound lane to a through right and in addition it would add dual lefts on Bake Parkway. Moving on to the street projects, I would like to note that while only three are listed, these projects are multi-phased. The street resurfacing and slurry seal program has two annual projects, an arterial roadway project and a residential roadway project. For 1920, the arterial roadway project would slurry seal Toledo, Serrano, and Ridge Route Drive. And in 2021, the project would resurface El Toro Road from Geronimo to Tribuco. This would be constructed in conjunction with the foothill circulation phasing plan that would install raised medians along this portion of El Toro as well. For 1920, the city is planning a residential slurry seal of Zone C, the highlighted area in red, and this would complete our seven-year cycle of the slurry seal program. For 2021, the city is starting the second round of the slurry seal program, which returns to Area G, which is the Portola Hills area. Uh, this map shows the seven zones and the past and future years for those zones. For the environmental projects, we're proposing two projects. Uh, the Catch Basin Screen Program phases eight and nine, and Packer Place Storm Drain Improvements, which addresses a flooding issue at Packer Place, which is the, the cut through street that was closed off and made into a park that tends to flood when it rains because the, um, the storm drain system through that little pocket park is just undersized. 
there are 12 park pro or 21 park pro 20, sorry i think it was 12 I'm sorry 21 park projects there are 21 park projects including the arbor mini park park playground and sports court resurfacing projects park light pole replacements and sidewalk rehabilitation and several projects at the city sports complex including and phases two and three of the neighborhood park renovation projects these renovations cover various improvements at the nine park locations improvements at peachwood park were included in the fiscal year 1819 and construction is scheduled to start before the end of this fiscal year i'm available for any questions if you have any capital budget discussions I, I have a, a few um on the neighborhood park renovations um what have been in place and have we completed any of those parks uh the peachwood park project is out for construction currently peachwood that's the yes. one that's the first we're starting with yes but the, all the other ones are actually already lined up as they're parks. they're programmed to bid and they're yeah. they're in we had that in the budget already Correct. So the the um, the designs are, are finishing up right now. We're getting ready to bid them. We pulled Peachwood Park quick, um, uh, ahead of schedule uh, to get that one going out because there's some interest by the by the community to get that one moving. So that one's moving, and the rest are all getting ready to bid out. Okay, but th those th actually money since we were going out to bid for that, we actually have money line item for those. C correct, and you're uh, approving additional monies. Thank for you. It. For them. Okay. Colleagues, anything else? I um, question this for legal counsel. So I, I see there's the um, resurfacing project in area C. Uh, where did that go? Somewhere in here I saw that. Page 10. All right, thank you. I have it up on the screen if you'd like. Well, I I live in area E, but it's at the very, very bottom end of E, and it's close to C and probably within the 500 foot. So I don't know if you're going to be doing actually anything on Tribuco itself, which is probably the only road that I would be within 500 feet of. So I'm just asking whether I should participate in that based on what you know. Um, Mayor, council members, the distance requirements under the FPPC related to um, how close your residence or property is has changed as of January or February 2019. Um, there's a presumption that under 500 feet there would be a conflict in, unless there's, um, you know, some evidence that it wouldn't be a conflict. And so there's different materi materiality standards that we can look at. This is a recommendation and not, you know, an actual decision on the budget, which will eventually be coming. And so we can look at those items more closely when an actual action is taken on the budget. Okay, so workshop not needed, but come time for the vote. Okay, thank you. Okay. Yeah, and I, I think I'm, I live in C right now. I think uh, Councilwoman Basil lives in G. So um, <laughs> I think because we're looking at a five-year, you know, street. I mean, chances are we're going to hit three or four or five council members and then we wouldn't be able to vote on the item you know there it's a citywide thing but I, I definitely understand the the concern always trying to make sure that we can deal with any potential legal ramifications so okay um, colleagues is there any direction we want to give staff on the capital budget I, I wouldn't propose any changes. I think they're all necessary. Okay. I, I do have a question on light on the sports park lighting poles. Um, on those replacements, those will be LED lighting. Yes. <laughs> is there any way that we can move that line item up? Because the fact is that every year we replace the lights at Heroes Park. And I've got major complaints from 
Lake Forest Little League about the lighting there at the park. But the fact is we go in and replace lights every year, and I don't know what the bulbs are, 100 or $200 each. Is there an – it might be just more efficient for us since that's coming our way to move the light lighting request up. Which project exactly are you I'm talking, are you talking about? about? The, we have a couple the, lighting projects. The, 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 the park lighting pole replacements. The, that, one, that one's the, for local parks and just the security lighting. Um, there's another one in the projects to be considered that's for Musco replacement at Heroes Park. I thought that was we were talking about. David. So there's two different ones. I think you're talking about the you're talking about the sports fields the, the lighting sports at Heroes field at Heroes Park. Where right. The kids are playing out there in Little League. So and that's a little farther down on your on your thing. Um, that's a all in. That's a seven hundred thousand dollar project to to replace those lights. But we we I've been out there with staff and they said that the new lights uh, halogen lights or not, or not LED lighting will be coming to that park. Uh, Mayor and members of the council, so I checked with Kevin. Financially, yes, you could move that up by two years, but we would need a chance to discuss it in terms of, <clears throat> excuse me, in terms of workload to see what that would mean. But financially, yes, you could move it, that up. It's just the fact forward. that we replace those lights every year, and they're $200 per bulb, and there's like 30 bulbs out there. Uh, so just the amount of money that we're spending every year just to replace the lights and bring the hoist out there. Um, if we're doing LED lighting, the lighting will be better for the kids playing ba baseball or Little League out there. And the fact that it, it, they're going to last long, longev longev it's going to save us money, and they're going to last a lot longer. No, we, we think it's a terrific project. That's why it's in there if, if council directs us to, to move it a, a, a year closer. And we'll, uh, I, I'm sure we can come back in, right. in, in yeah, well, yeah, June. I, I'm sorry. I just saw the, it the numbers the line changing. item here. So um, sure. nothing further. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, is there consensus for us to look at that? To look at moving that forward? To, yes, to advancing that project. I'm for. I'm just looking at the... Wh which page are we on here, just so that I can be looking specifically at the... Electron well, it's P12, or am I... It's 57, or electronically, I don't know, 340? 340. 340. Or 338, I'm off by two, I don't know. <laughs> That's a seven hundred twenty-five thousand dollar project. Am I looking at the right thing? Yes. Okay. So it's nothing this year. Next year it's thirty thousand, and then it's two hundred forty-five thousand in FY twenty-one, twenty-two, and then four hundred fifty thousand in twenty-two, twenty-three. So these are estimates. That the idea is um, to have a consultant come on board and, and tell us what the you know, payback period would be, what kind of savings we'd get, have it designed. That's the thirty thousand dollars to get the study done and design it and see what makes sense, bid it out, and then um, go ahead and implement those those improvements. So as it relates to this CIP, it's the $30,000 in the second year for the study analysis portion. Correct, as, as, as presented. As currently present, yes. Correct. And so by advancing it, presumably we would move that forward potentially one year and move that into the 1920, we could advance it one year. If just take that whole thing and move it forward one year. Correct. So the design, I don't think we have a problem with. I defer to the finance department to uh, make sure that that we could afford the the, the 245 thousand dollars. Yeah, the funding is there for all of the capital projects <laughs> included in the five-year strategic plan. I think we'd recommend doing the study this upcoming year, and then giving it to the ad hoc committee to discuss um, whether we advance that project into into year two, the actual construction. Okay, and if, let's just say for talking purposes, we did advance it one year, the study was done, that doesn't become stale or irrelevant. If the project is funded uh, two years later, just for talking purposes, that's still good information, I assume? I Correct, the logic would still hold if okay. the payback period is seven so years. So Council Member White, so what I'm hearing you say is, can we advance it all one year? Obviously, we're gonna come back with the capital budget and the ad hoc will look at the out years anyway. Yeah. Okay. So, and starting with that thirty thousand dollars, just to, to have our people go in there talk about the, the improvements on the lighting on the fields for the ball. Okay. And it's just a, it's kind of a, a thing that we're you know we we've talked about improving the parks and kids grow up and they they leave and then they say, man, I wish those were lights like that when I was playing or when Councilman Robinson's son was playing or my cousin's little boy is playing. It's a bit the fact that, you know, if we can move that forward and save the money of replacing those bulbs year after year for the next three years. 
I just like to look at that. Thank you. Sure. So you're looking for consensus that, okay, I, I support moving it forward one year as presented with the ad hoc looking at the expenditures. Okay, colleagues, anything else on capital budget? And this comes back to us for uh, approval when? Uh, it would come back to you for another review, first meeting in June, okay. and then it would come to you for adoption, second meeting in June. Okay. Colleagues, anything else on capital? Thank you. Going once, going twice. Nothing else on capital. That, are we moving on to strategic? We're gonna, okay, so I'm just going to sort of reiterate what I said earlier. Um, one thing I think that that is interesting is that we have the first year of the strategic <laughs> budget is actually also the same as the fiscal year. So I think one thing the ad hoc should consider is saying the strategic should start the following year, not the current year, and be five years ahead. So it wouldn't it would not be because we have this overlap going on now. We have a strategic budget. Um, as well as the operating budget there simultaneously. So anyway, that's a detail we can let the ad hoc uh, grapple with. But again, the, th the thing that's really driving me is when I look at that graph and I see us having a negative situation, that tells me that we need to be careful going forward. Um, and obviously there's other potential expenditures that we don't even know today what they may be um, that I think we need to be careful about. So. Um, I will be. I will uh, work with the city manager to form an ad hoc committee, and we'll do a, a closer look at all, all the cost centers and maybe even revenue opportunities if there are out there as well. So, sort of take take a look at both sides of that. And um, I'm not sure how formally to get the inputs, and it sounds like people want to give some direction to the ad hoc to look at other areas, and I'm completely fine with that. And maybe that should go through the city manager. So, if you do have thoughts, send it to her, and she can make a. Compile a list of all the things. If it be, any has any, anybody has any particular thoughts around anything that they should look at. So with that, I would ask that we continue the strategic budget, not worry about the years two through five at this point until the ad hoc has a chance to really look at it. So we're not hampering the operating budget. Um, it'll still go forward while the ad hoc looks at the at the five-year strategic budget. Unless anybody has any different thoughts uh, around that. Yeah, my, I, I think that it would be good for us to sit down with an ad hoc and kind of weed through this because um, the suggestions that we went on on, on that rabbit trail in the beginning, I just uh, think that we kind of got off place. So I'm, I'm in support of that. Okay. So, so to clarify, what you're you're proposing is the rest of these tables that we're currently looking at. We've been referring to uh, Foothill Circulation Phasing Plan. The Neighborhood Improvement Park Reserve Fund, Park Development Fund, all of these, you'd like to turn that over to the ad hoc committee so you guys can review it and that will come again before the council and we'll do the final approval of all these? Right. So only only year one are the ones that would touch the current budget. Okay. Correct me if I'm wrong. So, the, so if there's something in year one that needs to be discussed, then we should discuss that. But it's the really years two through five of the strategic budget okay. that I really want to... Okay, because I do have a question on okay. the, the park development fund expenditures. Okay, so we're back. So this is the strategic. Yeah. Okay. And it, yeah, it's year one. Because uh, I, I, am, I am concerned because, you know, we did approve uh, Whispering Hills Park. Uh, we talked about doing the, um, the actual plans one year, and then the following year we were going to actually build out the park. That was my understanding, correct? Correct. So this year you have $50,000 in your budget for preliminary park plans. Those are the conceptual plans. Um, the $2 million that you had budgeted previously were, was to pay for the design, construction, and everything related to the park. So probably 500000 of that would be for design and inspection and project management, and $1.5 would be available to actually construct the park. Okay. So, so what you're seeing in this table is... You've already approved a budget for Portola Park in your previous five-year plan, and so that money is set aside. We recently received our engineer's estimates for that park, and it's estimated to cost an additional $1.3 million, and so we're showing that on this table. There's also some alternatives for that park. We're also showing that additional cost on this table, and that's why we pushed out Whispering Hills to that third year, because the funding just isn't there. Okay. Um, what I'd like to propose then is 
I mean, we, we're in the middle of doing Portola Hills Park, and that is legally required by law. We have to do that part. Well, it's not by law. It's our development agreement. Okay. So we have a signed development agreement that obligates the city to build that park. Okay. So we obviously have to build that park. But what I'd like to do is um, the Portola, Portola Park alternative bid, that is for additional lighting for Correct. that park. What I'd like to do is um, I would like to move that out of plan year one. Um, maybe we can talk about retrofitting uh, underground and have it prepared for potential lighting in the future. But I think we should we should nix this in year one and we should move $500,000 to Whispering Hills Park so that we can get the actual design of Whispering Hills Park done. And then we can we can talk about how we're going to fund the 1.5 million. I just don't want this park to get forgotten. It's been 30 years, and we keep kicking this can down the road. But this can's getting old and rusty. It's time to finish this. Which park are you referring to? Whispering Hills. Okay. So so I'd like to move 500,000 into Plan Year One for that, and and nix the the costs for the Portola Park alternative bid. So I'm, well, obviously I'm new to council. I mean, it's been around a long time. I acknowledge that, but new. And I don't know where we are in the discussions. I know there's a lot of interest. We heard some of it tonight, but a lot of back and forth on what should or shouldn't happen there. Should it be a park? Should it be something else, right? Anything, I guess, but presumably if it's a park. I would need to have more information tonight or soon thereafter. I, I think that you know obviously that's uh, that's a part that uh, it, it has been deeded to us but the fact that we have had the studies but uh, I think that fair to say that, that they have a, a complaint that you know it's been a long time and we're down this road but I think we go back to the ad hoc and but I, if that is a suggestion I, I would think that the ad hoc can bring it back to us because we're not taking it off the table even before we'll be back for the next meeting and that way mayor can look at it and we'll have another council member here City Manager, is that acceptable? Because this is year one. Do we need to approve this tonight? Uh, we need direction on it. If you would like it to be um, something that we do next year, it'd have to be adopted in your two-year CIP. So there'd have to be a decision made. The ad hoc committee is a longer term project. I mean, that's going to take several meetings to get through all of that. So that's not anything that's going to be available for you to adopt by June 18th. So. I don't think this would be something that the ad hoc would discuss. I think the council's going to need to decide, you know, if you want to build Whispering Hills, we have to identify where is that $2 million going to come from. The issue with this um, fund right now is it's all based on the receipt of development fees. We don't have... We don't have $2 million in that account to pay for this, and so we would have to cash flow it. So even if we budget it, we'd still have to find that money somewhere. Am I permitted to mention, is it, oh, oh. thank you. <laughs> is, is, is the, is, how, how is the cash flow with our housing? Is housing still going moving forward as fast as rapidly as it was, or is it slowed at all? Um, the permits this year are on track with our budget. They're just a different composition of the builders that are building. Um, and so I had projections for Lennar to be building at this point, and they haven't pulled models yet. Um, and so my revenue projections in some areas are down because of the, the fee credits that are involved. Um, but we'll probably hit our permit count for this year. Um, and then I have a budget that for permits for next year that address the, the various impact fees. And those are included in the 1920 budget. And that's what leaves us on the park development fund with $1.5 million projected in the bank at the end of 1920. And that's only paying for 4.2 million of Portola Park. And so, if Portola Park costs 1.4 million dollars more, just from an alternative bid, then oh, that, that fund is essentially zero, oh. mm -hmm. and there is nothing right now available for Whispering Hills, unless you choose to design a different park in Portola Hills, because um, we could try to redesign and build a park for 4.2 million in Portola. Um, additionally, I have. Park development funds projected to be collected in 2021, and those numbers are roughly $950,000. And 
if I meet the target permits. In 2021, you'll have an additional $950,000, and that's the $2.5 million that's referenced in that table wow. in the strategic plan uh, staff report. Are there any other potential funds coming to us? We can't put names on them, but are there any other potential funds coming? Nothing that we could put on paper. So if the council wanted to look at this, you'd have to look at other funding sources. So that means uh, your CIP or your general fund, unless something in the future comes to fruition. So, so as I read this, I mean, it says, right, you know, city has insufficient funds for all the things listed in this table 10. So there's, we still have the issue about whether we want to go for the enhanced project for the Portola Park. <laughs> To the tune of two million dollars, roughly, if I add those two together, that seems paramount to me. Only because now is the time. If we don't do it now, then we probably never will. I'm that's guessing. Um, so, and, and even that's not funded. Let alone Whispering Hills. So, I, I I would benefit from hearing whatever the latest conversations are around the Whispering Hills Park site in terms of what's been thought about because I don't really know where the latest conversations have been gone for a few years <laughs> right so our, in our last strategic plan we talked about Whispering Hills and so where the council arrived was they wanted to see it built you know they really felt like it was time and the city had the resources at that point in time but they realized that we didn't have a, a there was no funding source for it like there was for Portola Park for example and so the council said, well, staff, go out. We're going to give you $2 million and see what you can do with the $2 million. That needs to include design, construction oversight, all the overhead available. And so that $2 million was really going to dictate what the park looked like. Um, so that pretty much was going to be a passive park. It wasn't going to have any active uses on it. It was going to be very simple. And so that's our current direction. Okay. And this, just to come back this is why in my mind when I look at the the graph the projections going forward it's that amount of revenue over expenses which helps to pay for the capital projects that we really want to do so when I see that we're near break even or even underwater in terms of the, those lines that means we're not putting money to CIP and that's why to me we really need to take a good hard look at a lot of our cost centers to see if we can generate a steady stream of dollars that we can set aside for capital improvement projects that's kind of what gave rise to the notion of really needing an ad hoc to go and scrub what we, where we are and um, because we need to generate dollars not only for capital projects, but I also think, you know, to make sure we have a really robust replacement fund as well. And that's, to me, the source of those dollars. So, so do we need to make a decision then on the Portola Park, those two items for Portola Park, since those are before us now? Or if not tonight, certainly at the next meeting in June? You know, what we could do is um, it's going to go out to bid. So once we have the real numbers, at that point, the council can determine funding. I think because right now we are dealing with engineers' estimates, so you would have actual information at that point in time. Okay. We think those bid amounts will be available. I'm looking at Tom, who's texting to get the answer <laughs> on his phone, a friend. So now <laughs> Doug is reading the text. <laughs> he uh, should be... August 6th, so on August 6th, approximately, we'll be doing a bid opening, but at that time, we could come back and, and you'll have real numbers, and then perhaps you'll have other news to announce as well, and we can have a more comprehensive conversation. And I'm really hoping for good news. Just can't say anything more, but I'm hoping for good news. All right. Is there anything else on the strategic plan discussion? No? So... I mean, when we're talking about moving all of those traffic study ideas to the ad hoc, but I mean, if I look at the tables, it's showing up in year one, right? So I'm a little confused on moving forward with year one, but not everything that's, I don't know what I'm, I'm probably misunderstanding something, so. Um, <coughs> it, it, those traffic studies, um, I heard the, the one um, traffic study that they want to do is, um, 
the widening of Fake Parkway, which be a, a $2.7 million. Or yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm talking about the traffic studies, let, the let, traffic commission. Let me take a shot at this, and then the city manager can tell yeah. me where I get it wrong. <laughs> um, those are under Table 3, potential new general fund expenditures, so they are not currently in the budget. And unless we take the action to put them in the budget, they sit outside the budget. They will still be part of the ad hoc's discussion. They maybe get moved out to a year or two, depending. We'll see. See what the ad hoc comes up with. But they're not currently in the budget. Okay. So just so everyone understands, they they won't be in the year one if we don't include them right now. Right? Correct, because it's yeah, under Table so. Three called potential yep. new. Uh, understood. Yep. Okay. That's correct. Did you have anything else? I'm good. Okay. Councilmember Robinson. Uh, I can check with council member Voits while you look. Okay. So you're yeah. good. Okay. So what that's telling me is everything in those potentials are not doing. So we're not doing community choice aggregation study for animal care, our autumn harvest festival, star Wars night, astronomy night, all of those, right? Right. That you wouldn't be doing those starting July 1st. Those would not be in your budget. The ad hoc committee could look at all of this, reallocate, and decide to bring some back at the mid-year or in yeah. the following year's operating budget, but they wouldn't be in the budget you have on July 1st. Yep. So just trying to make sure everybody's clear. So anything right. that the ad hoc committee would look at that would potentially not meet the, the timeline guide. So like if the ad hoc committee hasn't made a decision, then there won't be any seasonal lighting. There won't be the autumn harvest fair, festival, stuff like that. So just want to make sure we're all going into this eyes wide open. And that's why I wanted to stop yeah. on that particular table I, and draw attention to it. I, I appreciate it. And we kind of looked at number one and then kind of didn't talk about the rest. Gotcha. And a public comment came on the traffic ones. And so just want to make sure that we're all, uh, you know, understanding because it's, you know, we're looking at, close to 600 pages here that, that we all read through and it, it can get fairly confusing. And, and I don't want anybody yep. to think the door's closed on any of these. Or sure, no. absolutely. Yep. Yep. Okay, so I'm hearing that we, I think, are finished unless staff has any more needs. We, I think we're done with a strategic plan as well. We're good, getting thumbs up, okay. So we've taken care of the- Mr. Mayor. Yes. We do have several speakers oh. on the strategic plan. Oh, I'm I sorry, please, yes. Call them. Um, Mr. Kenton Bocher, followed by um, Betty Atwell. Mayor and Councilman, I, <clears throat> I'm the same person that was up here before. Um, <coughs> I, I guess I don't know what to say. I, I'm, I'm very disappointed about Whispering Hills. Um, it's been kicked down the road, and money isn't available because you took money for the city hall that should have been provided for projects that had been on the docket for many, many years. And, and when I talk to people about this project, we've had a number that were very supportive of it. They've died. Uh, I've spent over the half of my life working with this project, and it, it really is, um, people won't come to the meetings anymore because they know that it's just gonna be kicked down the road. And I would much rather have you just say, it's not gonna happen. That way I could get back to my life. Um, this whole project has really shadowed my life in that it has colored the way that I look at civic process and government process. Um, I, I wouldn't even list what has been said to me by city uh, employees over the years. Um, they told me 20 years ago, never ever would there be a park there. And in the, in the past few years, it's, it's flowered. I, if you look at the El Toro Water District Private Park, it's beautiful from the, the street. Uh, it's water-wise, it's educational, um, it's almost acre in size, cost $300,000. Uh, Riata Park in San Juan Capistrano, it's 18 acres, it's where Joan um, uh, Irvine Smith has her stables. 
beautiful uh, orange groves and uh, California natives and uh, fruit trees that you can just pick. Very low expense, very low cost. Um, and this is geographically in the center of Lake Forest. And I don't know how many people say, what's that scar doing there? Why doesn't the city do that? And we got screwed because we weren't in Melrose. Yeah. The developer walked away, the county walked away, the city walked away. And, you know, and I've had people, as of Monday, just say give up, just walk away. And uh, I've only lived in two places in all my life where I was born in the, the 40 years here. And they said, maybe it's a third time, just, just leave. You won't have to look at it every day of your life. And so I, I think you really need to back up and say, what are the people, you know, th there's children that started out, um, I can remember having a conversation with my first neighbors in, in 1987, and they were talking about taking their child down to the park when it came. That, that young man's 33 years old. And that shouldn't happen in a, a process where, we claim to be debt free, yet we've we've constricted the the amenities for our, our you know our residents to to make our, our city debt free. So I, I think there really needs to be a conscious decision. Is it something that's going to be reality or not? And just let us, uh, you know. And and that's all I'm asking. And I, I um, if I could do it back, I, I probably should have lived somewhere else. It, it's just not, um, I, in good faith, bought into a development. Uh, developer screwed us over. The county screwed us over. And, and quite frankly, the, the city screwed us over. So thank you. Thank you for your comments. Kenton, I'm so sorry you feel that way. I know how challenging it is for your community and yeah and to have little kids who are going to play at a park and now they're you know 30 years old it's very sad you know i'm i'm with you i want to see that park built i really really want to see that park built so i'm going to keep fighting for you because i think it's really important it's important for your community so don't give up and just to clarify the city halls being built with certain dollars would they be available to move over there? I didn't think so, but maybe you can. No. The city hall is being built with uh, impact fees that were negotiated through developer agreements that have specific uses, and that is only for the sports park and the Civic Center campus. I just want to clarify, just because I don't want somebody to think that we've absconded with all the money with the city hall at the expense of anything, including Whispering Hills. Okay. Um, we have um, Betty Atwell followed you. by Steve Moyer. Good evening, council members. I'm Betty Atwell, currently the vice chair of the Senior Advisory Board. I'm a 32-year resident of Whispering Hills, and I feel like I'm beating a dead horse at this point. But I do want to mention a couple of things, particularly from the senior standpoint. We were hoping that with a passive park that was a beautiful place to go, also having a garden, community garden available, our seniors could make use of that very well. They, can, they don't drive, they can take the taxi that's very reasonable for them to move about the city, come and get outside, socialize, maybe help in the garden. And that just doesn't sound like that's ever going to happen. It's, I, I'm, I'm 20 years I spent in city government, and I'm just amazed that we can't get this beautiful park built and make the city look better for it. A lot of cities have put in garden parks, and they've done very, very well. Another thing is, if you ever go down Lake Forest Drive near Dimension around noontime, you'll see a lot of people, workers, walking up and down Lake Forest on their lunch break. If there was that beautiful park right there, they could go in, they could sit on a bench, read a book, they could talk to people, and 
it just seems like a, a simple thing to do and yet an impossible thing to get done. So we hope something will happen somewhere down the road. Hey. Thank you. Next. Steve Moyer followed by Jim Rick Richter. Good evening, Mayor and Council Members. My name is Steve Moyer, and I'm CEO of the nonprofit organization called AgeWell Senior Services. AgeWell provides home delivered meals to seniors at risk in the 400 square mile of Southern, California, or South, Southern Orange County region that we serve, including residents in the city of Lake Forest. This past year, AgeWell has served approximately 25,000 home delivered meals to senior residents in the city of Lake Forest. On average, over half of the senior residents that we serve are homebound and live alone. Most of the seniors would not have access to a nutritious meal if AgeWell was not able to provide. It's incumbent upon us to identify funding sources in order to provide services to the communities we serve. I had a life-changing quick story that I'd like to tell you where, as I served on the board of senior service, uh, 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 AgeWell Senior Services, at the time it was South County Senior Services, and I decided to go on a Meals on Wheels run and that changed my life. I was with a volunteer, and the volunteer knocked at the door of a lady, and I was running a restaurant corporation at the time. And I thought, why am I going on this Meals on Wheels? Because I got restaurants that are potentially blowing away in Hawaii because it was hurricane season. And as I looked through the screen, there was a lady I'll call Mrs. Smith. And Mrs. Smith was rubbing her knees, and she had a heating pad around her neck. And the volunteer walked in, and Mrs. Smith absolutely beamed. The reason being is that that volunteer was the only person that Mrs. Smith was going to see that day. Mrs. Smith was totally blind and living by herself. The volunteer went in as I went in also, and the volunteer brought three meals, a hot meal put on the oven, and the other two meals put in the, put in the refrigerator and told Miss Smith exactly what, what meals she had brought. In addition, the volunteer went through and took a look at all of the food in the refrigerator and discarded the out-of-date food that Mrs. Smith had and told Mrs. Smith exactly what it was. As that volunteer was there, the volunteer assessed Mrs. Smith, and there will be times as we all get older, unfortunately, and I'm a senior, <laughs> um, there's, there's a point that we will not be well. Mrs. Smith will not be well. And that volunteer assesses <laughs> Mrs. Smith, makes the determination and when Mrs. Smith needs additional help, she goes back, reports to a supervisor, and supervisor brings in all of the other services that AgeWell Senior Services have to help Mrs. Smith in any way that she needs help. As we walked out that day, I thought, what a tremendous organization that has 500 volunteers working for it. This, this company was. And so at such time as I had the ability and a new CEO was needed, that's when I raised my hand to, to literally, um, because this changed my life, this particular thing. So the thing that I, I really want to tell you is that. I, I hate to do this, but could okay. you I'm try to wrap up? Yeah, okay. just, that's fine. Just go ahead and finish th your th thing. Th thank, thank you for um, considering the support that you give our nonprofit organization regarding the home delivered meals program uh, to senior residents in the city of Lake Forest in your general fund. Thank you very much. Thank you very Sorry much. Sorry to take so much. Time. Oh, that's fine. Thank you very much. Yep. Appreciate it. 
And last speaker is Jim Riker. And he We're getting a no. He must yeah. he, did he leave. Okay. Okay. Did you have something? Yeah, I just so I wanted to comment on the Whispering Hills issue as well. So I, I understand you and uh, Mayor Pro Tem Motazidi, um aren't privy to all the discussions we've had. I, I think that we've talked about this park um, every single budget year that I've been on the council. And uh, I, I would agree with the comments that it's been kicked down the road. Um, I, I think there's some, there's a lot of confusion about everything that we vote on tonight <laughs> or everything that we discuss, where all the funding sources are and things like that. I can imagine that it's, it's incredibly confusing for just a, a resident who's trying to take a look at it. I mean, we've got all these, these uh, traffic improvement projects, um, you know, things going on at Bacon Tribuco and Geronimo and all these sorts of things. And there's, there's certain funding mechanisms that come into place for some of the projects. There's funding that comes in for the previous sports park that we built and now the civic center and the senior center and things like that. <clears throat> I think, one of the frustrations that residents will have from time to time is that they're, they're wondering who their advocate is. So you look at each one of the department budgets, some of them are going up, some of them are going down, and their advocate is the department head. And then you look at some of the projects that we have in place, and you know clearly any type of new development, um, you know we're tying projects to developer fees, like the Civic Center, like uh, Portola Park, you know, the sports park, you know, lo lots of those things, Baker Ranch Park, you know, those sorts of things. But then you feel like, well, if you predate all of that stuff, then will there ever be a funding mechanism for your particular area? And, and I can understand the frustration. I mean, I've been supportive of this park just about every single year that it, it's come about. Maybe I was a little more supportive the last few years than I was at the beginning. I'm sure that's probably fair to say, but you know, I, I've, I've been supportive of it. Where we find the money, I don't know. Um, you know. I know that we're talking about August 6th or something coming back with Portola Park numbers. I'd say, look, if we thought we were gonna build a $4.2 million park, we should build a $4.2 million park. And if there's potential additional costs here, then we need to adjust what we're doing there in the design. All that does is get us to zero. It doesn't necessarily get us to, you know, the beginnings of a commitment that we made last year with design on this, but, you know, it, it's, I, I know the, the answer from, from staff is going to be, if you want to see this park built, then you need to go to your CIP or you need to go to your general fund to fund it because there will never be a direct funding mechanism unless we kind of do one out of order. For instance, there's some infill development in one part of the city that somehow you know, pays for a park in another part of the city because there's just really nothing adjacent to that that's probably going to dramatically change. We looked a little bit in the general plan update about maybe some, some zoning changes along uh, Lake Forest Drive there around Dimension. So uh, maybe that might be one way of doing it. But, you know, I, I definitely understand the frustration. Um, and again, I've been supportive of this park and I'm, I'm supportive tonight for it. Um, you know, I'm just, where do we find the money to actually do this? You know, and that's something that, uh, you know, I hope that this ad hoc committee can take a look at is a lot of things that we need to, to, uh, to focus on, but, you know, it's we have to. I think sometimes we have to ask ourselves. So, does this park need a rehab, and this park doesn't get done? It's probably not a one for one. Maybe it's these four parks need a rehab, and so we spend the money there, but this park doesn't get done. That, you know, some in the community have felt like it should have been done for years and years and years. You know, those are the questions that we need to grapple with. And uh, you know, aside from the the community that's come out at different times and just, you know, to give a little background here, we've had, I'd say upwards of 50 people show up um, at particular meetings just to talk about this park, you know, so it's not just a select few, it's been, you know, pretty decent size. We've had petitions from probably 100 plus, uh, maybe even 200 from the Lake Forest Garden Club, things like that. But aside from all of that, you know, I, I think it was alluded to, but, this, major thoroughfare in Lake Forest and you know we've put some fencing around because it was an eyesore so we got to do something with it eventually it shouldn't just be you know a mound of dirt 
three acre mound of dirt for, um, you know, another 30 plus years. Um, you know, that would be, uh, yeah, it would be. And, and again, not just for one part of the community, but I think for the entire community. So, you know, I, I really hope the ad hoc committee takes a look at that. Good. Good comments. Thank you. Um, could I get whatever a, a nice summary of whatever the latest conversations? Again, I'm coming back after a hiatus here, so if I could see whatever has been done, that'd be helpful <laughs> for me. Whatever, whatever com correspondence there's been between the council, or just whatever you have that kind of updates me on the Whispering Hills. Yeah, I mean, if there's been any concepts put out, prices put out, and just. I'm trying to understand what what's been discussed for the. Well, currently there is a thirty thousand, fifty thousand for a preliminary design in the budget right now. That just has not been started. But if you're looking for background, like yes. what exists, we'd have to get that to you. Yeah, I'm that's fine. fine. Yeah. But it just help for me to and, catch up on. And we'll the give last that to the years. entire council. <laughs> yeah, just, thank you. I, I think just roughly we've done like half a dozen community workshops we went one direction then went another we've had competing interests on the site and you know i'm sure not everybody's happy but we kind of settled the most recently on some sort of passive park that i think some would say has a community garden component and some would say that's still up for debate but you know it, it kind of settled there but i'll let them give you the details and, that's and just two million dollars just that's needed for what Right, that's what the council voted to put in the five-year plan was a two million dollar budget, and that was going to dictate what was on there. Right, I'm just what I'm saying though is, has somebody just sort of said, "What does it take to make a passive park like the El Toro Water District?" Sort of that type of an experience. Not saying that's exactly what you wanted, but using that as a template and move it over here just for size. Is that a two million dollar project? Do we that? Uh, we'd have to look into that. Okay. I, I don't okay. know. I, I'd say just from my recollection. Uh, more of what it was was we recognize something needs to be done here, but we're going to put a cap on the dollar amount so that you know. And there, there wasn't as much detail as as you're looking for. Right. No, I was just trying to say, uh, yeah. is it is it a half a million dollars to get to a nice passive park, or does it take the two two million dollars? Just because if we said sure. two million is a target, that's a bigger thing to find than going to find half a million. If you could do it for half a million, and I don't know, so we'll, we'll see what comes up. Okay, I think you're going to be pretty limited with $2 million. I don't know if, Tom, you want to... We've, we've had these conversations. We have had those conversations. So, uh, Councilmember Robinson, I, I think, said it accurately. They capped it. I'm not going to say it arbitrarily, but, but there was certainly a cap put on that without a design associated with that. Mm -hmm. So, for context, we're talking tonight about a five-acre park at Portola Hills for $5 million. Um, that's a, about a five-acre park out there at Whispering Hills. So not the same level, not the same park, right? But it, that's a number, right? <laughs> Village Pond Park was, uh, that's four or five acres. Uh, we spent about $3 million on that. Um, uh, all, all in you know, part of that was the pond and stuff like that but again some some numbers they get you we, we don't have connections out there we don't have grading um, we don't have a lot of things so I'm not exactly sure what two million dollars will will get you we can certainly do something but it it'll be more passive or more rustic than 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 not so that's part of it, it just no there's a number without a design associated with it right right now yeah Thank you. No, that's, that's helpful. But I'll look for the rest of the information as well. So that's much appreciated. I don't see anything calling for council member comments on the agenda. So no. So with that, we are adjourned. Thank you all for being here. <laughs>